Hi everyone, welcome to the Histology Revision interactive video that we've prepared for you to help you revise and prep for the coming exam. These are the tissues that we will revise and cover. And remember, we want to make it really clear that all content presented in this video is examinable. Nothing, you will not be examining anything other than the content of this video. The first series of slides in this video will be looking at active and inactive mammary glands. So let's start looking at mammary glands. Bithya, can you describe to us what we're seeing here histologically in these three sections? Sure, Daniela. So on the far left here, we have a histological section of non-pregnant breast tissue. In the middle, we have a section of breast tissue during pregnancy. And finally, on the far right, we have tissue from a lactating breast. So on the leftmost image of the non-pregnant breast, we can see these structures that are collectively called lobules. So here we have one lobule, here we have another one. Lobules are made up of ducts and alveoli, or lactiferous ducts. Thanks, Vith. So let's have a look at how the structure and the shape of the lobule changes throughout the different states of mammary tissue. So if we focus on the image in the middle of pregnant breast tissue, we can see that the lobules are getting much larger um, as we proceed towards birth, childbirth. Specifically, the lobules are enlarging because of the glands and the duct systems that are rapidly growing and developing. So as the uh, ducts and the glands are growing larger, the secretory units are becoming larger and branching more as well. So what does the A in the middle image stand for? Yep, so the tissue, the breast tissue is made, also made up of adipocytes. And while we have quite a bit of breast made up of adipocytes in this image, we only see a few cells here and there. Great, thank you. So moving on to the image on the right. So in this image, the lobules have become really large because now we're looking at breast tissue um, of lactating breast post-birth. So the lobules have become large mainly because of the fact that the alveoli and the ducts are now being filled with this pink substance and that pink substance is the milk. Thank you Vithya. So can you please, before we move on to other slides, can you please comment on the connective tissue changes that we're seeing across these three slides? Yep, so I think it's just really um, vivid in this uh, in, in these images here that as we go from left to right, i.e. from non-pregnant to pregnant to lactating tissue, we can see how clearly that the connective tissue is reducing and it's only really sparsely available in the far right tissue of the lactating breast compared to in the first image where we can see the term CT all over the image. So going through some other images of mammary tissue, on the left here we've got an image at low magnification and moving on to the right, here we've got a nice high mag image of, in particular, of the lactiferous duct over here. So Vithya, could you please tell me what cells actually line this duct? Yep, so like most glands, um, the sort of cells that you're going to expect to find lining a lactiferous duct are either going to be cuboidal or columnar in shape. Now you don't have to know the specifics of that too much, um, for, for, purposes, for the purposes of your exam. So can you tell me what other cells are present there? Yep, yeah, so in this image here we can see um, a lymphocyte has been labelled for you. And yep, yeah, lymphocytes are important in the breast tissue for two main purposes. One is that they fight or um, they battle against um, antimicrobial activity or they serve as antimicrobial agents. And the second main important function about them is that they differentiate or become plasma cells and plasma cells will then start producing antibodies. Also we have these cells that are known as myoepithelial cells but let's talk about them more in the next slide. Here's another few images that are great for practicing. So seeing as the left hand side image is labelled, let's take the students through together labelling the image on the right hand side. 
So I think if we start with feature F, that is again a lactiferous duct, and the duct is being lined by these cuboidal epithelial cells, as I mentioned in the last slide. Now G is this really special cell type that's called a myoepithelial cell, and these cells actually have contractile pro uh, processes that they stick and surround the lobule to, or the duct to then contract the lobule and expel or secrete the milk products that are within the lumen. So what are these eye cells then? Eye cells are those really important defense cells uh, that are called lymphocytes and these lymphocytes can then go on to differentiate and become plasma cells to produce antibodies as we most of us know by, by probably know by now um, the first uh, secretions that come out of a lactating breast is known as colostrum and that is really rich in antibodies but the other function of lymphocytes which you should also know is that they are antimicrobial um, so they also serve a defense purpose within the breast tissue as well and finally what's the h in the image that we are seeing so feature h are adipocytes or fat cells as most people would know them and adipose tissue or fat cells are also found in both the epithelial lining cells but also the milk product in within the um, lactiferous ducts as well thank you Vithya. in terms of the gastrointestinal tract what we'd want you to be able to do is based on seeing histological images identify the segment of the tract um, that you're in. So the layers that we will take you through include the mucosa, submucosa, the muscularis, and then the serosa or the adventitia going from the mouth to the bottom of the large intestine. Hi Mario, thank you for joining us in this video. We really appreciate all your expertise on the histology of the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, hi all, it's great to be here to talk a little bit about the gut. So I can think... you please start us off? We're now going to go from the top to the bottom. So can you please start us off with the esophagus and how it looks histologically yeah. and how it differs? No to problem. So really areas. important to understand that the wall of the gut is made of four different layers, as you've heard, and these different layers look a little bit different as you move through the various regions of the gut. So if we start here on the esophagus, I mean, it's pretty easy in this low power picture to see that the esophagus is made of different layers. So we have a kind of layer here at the top, which is the mucosa. Um, underneath this we have the submucosa, we have a really thick layer of muscle um, and then finally we have a serosa layer. This bit here is probably a bit of muscle as well. Okay, so if we look at images two and three we can see uh, the layer of the wall in much more detail. So here we've got, oh, I'll just press a different button, here we've got uh, the mucosa layer um, and actually the mucosa extends just a little bit further down there, which is made up of um, lots of layers of flat cells. So here it is again. Lots of layers of flat cells on top of each other to protect against abrasion and also bacteria that might be on the surface out here. Um, we then have a submucosa layer. A submucosa layer is loose to dense connective tissue that it provides strength and support for the mucosa layer. So if we just label these, this is the mucosa layer and this is the submucosa layer. Here we have lots of bundles of collagen to provide strength and support. Lots of these cells here are fibroblasts which make the collagen and elastin. Um, if we look at this image um, down here, it's a little bit hard to see, but this is a uh, muscularis layer, which is going to um, enable peristalsis or movement of food in the esophagus. All right, Mario, so can you please tell me what I'm looking at over here? So this slide is really simple. It's just the gastroesophageal um, junction, or another way of saying that is the junction between the esophagus and the stomach. And um, here we have on this side the esophagus. And you can see that because we've got stratified squamous epithelium. And on this side we've got the stomach. So that junction would be around here in this lower power picture. And all we really wanted to show you is that this junction is really distinctive and sudden. So there isn't a gradual transition from one epithelium, so stratified squamous here, through to simple columna here. It's just a, a sudden break um, when you hit the stomach. Um, the stomach doesn't have um, stratified squamous epithelium. It has simple columnar epithelium, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. Moving on from the slide below, 
and the gastroesophageal junction. Let's get right into the stomach, Mario. Yeah, so it's pretty obvious that we're looking at the stomach in this picture, not just because somebody wrote stomach on this picture. <laughs> I think that was you, Daniela. Yes. But you can also see um, these really nice um, folds, these kind of rugae that are sticking out on the surface of the stomach. And they're things you can actually see, not just under a microscope, but in real life when you look at the stomach. So the layers are all here. You've got your mucosa layer here. You've got your submucosa, this kind of darker pink layer here. Uh, you've got the muscularis layer here, and you've got your serosa layer at the very edge there. So all of those layers are visible. Um, if we look at this high power image over here, so this image here, um, here we've got the mucosa layer um, on the surface. And um, the mucosa layer is uh, flat on the surface. And this is because we don't have villi sticking up into the lumen. Instead, we have glands that go down. Um, so if we kind of think about it, the epithelium is diving down like this, and then it comes back up and then goes down again and then comes back up and goes down. What is the name of those glands, Mario? Um, so they're intestinal glands, um, and they have little kind of holes on the surface, um, or pits, so they're called gastric pits, these pits on the surface. And um, basically, this is where material escapes into the lumen. Um, but the epithelium is flat. Um, in real life, there would then be a layer of mucus on the surface of the epithelium here. This mucus would be coming from these goblet cells, which you see at the very surface, which are very pale staining. They're the ones that make the mucus. Um, further down in these gastric uh, glands, you have the more specialized cells. So goblet cells on the surface, these kind of darker, pinker, um, cells lining the bottom here. These are your parietal cells, your um, chief cells, your enteroendocrine cells, all of the cells that uh, make special things like pepsinogen and um, hydrochloric acid. They would all be there. Thank you for labelling that, Mario. No problem. So continuing on to move down the gastrointestinal tract, here we're looking at a low magnification image of the small intestine. Before we move into the other ones further, would you like to take us through this section, please? And no problem. Once again, I uh, just wanted to point out that the four layers that make up the wall are really obvious in this picture. So we have here the muscularis, uh, sorry, the mucosa layer, um, really obvious because it's quite dark. Um, we have then the submucosa layer. Now here the submucosa layer is fairly pale because it's not very um, uh, thick and dense, but actually in real life it tends to be quite uh, a bit denser than this. And then we have a muscularis layer um, at the bottom. And this muscle here is all about churning, uh, sorry, all about um, peristalsis and segmentation. So moving food along the gut and mixing it with acids. And then finally, we have a serosa layer, which keeps the small intestine wet so and slippery so that it doesn't, um, you don't get friction between different parts of the, the gut. Okay, so this picture is uh, an enlarged or zoomed in part of the surface of the small intestine. Uh, and what we really wanted to show you in this picture is the mucosa. So here is the mucosa once again, just mark that with an M. And here it is on the other side. So you have to remember this is kind of flipped um, this bit of the gut over on itself. But if we look at it in high power, you can basically see that you have these villi or fingers that kind of stick out from the surface of the small intestine. So the small intestine, unlike the stomach, isn't flat on its, on its surface. It's actually um, got these fingers or villi that stick out. And lining these um, villi, we have lots of cells. So I'm trying to draw these cells quite big here, um, but obviously they're a little bit smaller than that. Um, these cells, again, are a mixture of uh, mucus or goblet producing cells. And at the base here, they would be um, your more specialized cell here. Um, <clears throat> straight underneath these um, epithelial cells is some lamina propria. So this here is just loose connective tissue. It's got blood vessels to take and absorb nutrients. Um, but it's also got lots of defense cells, um, which protects against um, invading or possibly invading bacteria in the gut. And sitting right underneath uh, that uh, lamina propria or loose connective tissue is the muscularis mucosa. So the muscularis mucosa is just a thin layer of smooth muscle 
which contracts to move these villi to kind of wiggle them around in the gut so that they can absorb uh, nutrients um, easily. Mario, just to recap, so you've talked about the lamina propria and the muscularis mucosa. Are these two features um, ex present or displayed throughout the gastrointestinal tract? Yes, they are. Um, sometimes it's a bit hard to actually see them in, in other layers, but um, the lamina propria, that little bit of loose connective tissue underneath the epithelial cells, is always present in the gut, and so is the muscularis mucosa layer. Um, it's always present um, in the gut to kind of uh, move the intestinal glands, or in this case, the villi about. So we've reached the bottom now. Let's finish off with looking so at the speak, large intestine. because we're so on the uh, colon. <laughs> um, let's look at the large intestine here. Yeah, so we're in the large intestine here. Again, we've got low uh, and then medium and high power pictures here. If I start with the low power picture once again, um, as we've been saying all along, there's a mucosa layer, um, there is a submucosa layer, there is a muscle layer, a muscularis layer, and then there's a serosa layer here. Um, I just want to focus on this muscularis layer. You'll notice that there's two different um, kind of layers to that. So here's one layer and here's another layer. So in the large intestine, so the colon, you either have one or two layers of um, muscle. You have an inner circular layer of muscle and an outer longitudinal layer of muscle. That outer longitudinal layer of muscle here is incomplete. So when it exists, you have 10 A coli, these strips of longitudinal muscle on the edge of uh, the colon, um, but when it doesn't exist, you don't um, see it. So we're looking at a section here through a 10 A coli because you can see this longitudinal layer. If we look at the medium and high power pictures, they're really just showing um, the uh, mucosa layer. Uh, and once again, you have um, epithelium that's diving down to form intestinal glands um, rather than having villi that stick up. Um, and what's unusual about the intestinal glands in the colon, what separates them from the glands in the stomach, is the glands are very straight. So if this were the stomach, the glands would kind of go down and then they would branch like this into lots of different segments and then go back up and then branch into lots of different segments. But in the colon, the glands go down and then they go straight back up and then down and straight back up again. So it's a very um, straight up and down like you can see here. And that's a classic colon. If you look, most of the cells lining the colon here are mucus or goblet cells, which makes sense. The mucus that these cells make um, lubricates the surface of um, the colon here and stops the dry fecal material from scraping along and damaging the surface. Excellent, Mario. Now that we've gone through that, the next two images are just practice images for the students. So really quickly looking at this image, tell me how is it that I'd be able to identify within two seconds of where I'm looking at in the gastrointestinal tract? Yep. So hopefully you've picked up some cues from what we've discussed chatted about in the previous slides. This slide is really easy. Um, if you look at the surface here and it's enlarged, um, this is lots of layers of cells stacked on top of each other. Um, so you've got this really dense pink um, layer on the, so on the top. Um, this has to be stratified squamous um, epithelium. And you'd find that epithelium, of course, in the esophagus. So again, Mario, this looks very different to the image that we've just seen. So where are we at the moment? So this mystery image, um, if you look uh, higher power at the um, mucosa layer, you see that it's fairly um, flat on top. Um, but then you have these glands which branch into all sorts of weird and wonderful directions below. So branching um, glands, intestinal glands, has to be the stomach. So um, that's the identifying feature, a distinguishing feature between the stomach and, for example, me confusing this with the invaginations or the folds of the colon. Yes. In the colon, these um, glands would go straight up and down like this. But here we've got glands that kind of start straight, um, then they branch into all sorts of um, unintelligible um, cavities and, and tunnels which you can't really see. The other thing that tells you this is the stomach is you've got lots of mucus cells on the surface to neutralize against stomach acid, so making mucus here. And then you've got really dark pink cells um, further down in the um, uh, glands and these will be your parietal cells, your chief cells, your endocrine cells making specialist product.
And again, the mucus producing cells are the goblet cells yep. that we've got. And there is one other thing, by the way, that tells you this is a stomach. If we go back to the low power image, there's three layers of muscle here. So really thick layer of muscularis, uh, muscularis, yeah. And we've got an inner circular, a middle oblique, and we've got an outer longitudinal. And these three layers of muscle you'd only find in the stomach for churning. Excellent, thank you.